Hola, buenas tardes. Este, bienvenidos a el seminario de Frontiers in Genomics, que como saben es organizado por la, el Centro de Ciencias Genómicas, el Instituto de Biotecnología y la Licenciatura en Ciencias Genómicas. Como ven, después de dos años, este va a ser la primera vez que vamos a tener un seminario semipresencial. Este, hay gente conectada por Zoom, hay gente que está aquí y otros por YouTube. Este, antes de que se me olvide, les recuerdo que obviamente los que están aquí en el auditorio a la hora de las preguntas pueden hacer la mano y hacer su pregunta directamente. Este, los que están por Zoom pueden alzar la mano en el, en el chat o pueden este, poner su pregunta en el chat, ¿sí? igual los de YouTube. Bueno, entonces este, vamos a iniciar. Para mí es un gran gusto presentarles a la doctora Polly Fordyce. La doctora Fordyce es Assistant Professor en Bioingeniería y Genética y Scholar del Instituto de Química, Ingeniería y Medicina para, este, me, a, aplicada a, a, a humanos en la Universidad de Stanford. Su laboratorio está enfocado en el desarrollo y aplicación de nuevas plataformas de microfluidos de alto rendimiento en biofísica, bioquímica y biología a nivel de una sola célula. La doctora Fordyce se graduó en la Universidad de Colorado en Boulder con grados en física y biología. Y después de esto, en Stanford, hizo su doctorado en física con el profesor Steve Block, en el que desarrolló instrumentos y técnicas para estudios a nivel de single molecule sobre las proteínas motor kinesinas. Sus estudios de postdoctoral los realizó con el profesor Joe DeRees, para el desarrollo de nuevas plataformas de microfluidos para entender cómo factores transcripcionales reconocen y se unen a sus secuencias blanco en el DNA. Y así también desarrollar nuevas metodologías de multiplex basadas en bits, en perlas, para, usándolas como herramienta. La doctora Fordyce ha recibido varios premios y reconocimientos, simplemente para mencionar algunos, por ejemplo, el NSF Career Award, un NIH New Innovator Award, el Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship y es Chan Zuckerberg Biohub Investigator. El día de hoy pues, nos va a hablar de microfluidos aplicados a biofísica, bioquímica y al nivel de una sola célula, single cell biology. Bueno, Polly, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Es un honor tenerte aquí con nosotros. Y bueno, esta es la primera de, después de mucho tiempo en el programa que vienes a, a podernos dar en persona el seminario. Hola, uh, muchas gracias por invitarme. Es un honor y un placer de estar aquí con ustedes. Yo vine a Cuernavaca para la primera vez en 1993 para aprender el español. Uh, y yo quería dar la lectura en español, pero me di cuenta de que no conozco muchas palabras científicas, entonces voy a hacerlo en inglés pero muchas gracias por su paciencia y para la oportunidad. Ok. Uh, let's see. Ok. So, today I want to tell you about some of the things that my lab is really passionate about. Um, and one thing that we're very interested in is understanding how macromolecules work because this is the length scale and size where physical forces uh, have outcomes that determine how cells and even organisms behave. And so at a really fundamental level, we have physical forces that determine whether the amino acids within a linear polypeptide chain, um, whether they fold to assume a compact structure and the folding stability of that structure. They also determine whether those proteins go on to do their jobs, whether that job is to bind DNA as a transcription factor, bind other proteins as a signaling protein, or catalyze a chemical reaction if they're an enzyme. And this is again determined by physical forces, as well as the conditions under which these reactions take place. So you might or might not have these reactions depending on the concentrations um, at which these molecules are present, the temperature, the salt conditions um, that we see, and whether or not these amino acids are mutated. And then this entire constellation of molecular interactions is what comes together 
to determine the fate of a cell, the state of a cell, whether that's the transcriptome or um, the, the current signaling state of that cell. And I think if there's any doubt about how intimately the physics of the system is coupled to the biology, we can think about the human beta globin gene. So at the sixth amino acid residue, if there's a mutation that changes it from a charged amino acid to a hydrophobic amino acid, that causes the molecule to, to adopt the exact same structure and only under par particular conditions, under conditions of low oxygen, these structures, instead of forming uh, these hemoglobin you know, tetramers that we know and love, they cause the formation of these long fibrils. And these fibrils are what lead to sickle cell disease. Right? So it's just a disruption of a single physical force at a single amino acid position that can cause really serious disease at the level of a human. Um, and so if we had some way to predict function from sequence alone, it could be really transformative. That's kind of the dream of my lab. Um, so you know, in medicine, we could sequence someone's genome and we could predict the functional effects of the mutations that they have. And it might allow us to develop both novel diagnostics and novel ther therapeutics. Um, in engineering, if we could design enzymes, we could do all kinds of chemical reactions without generating waste, and we'd have new ways to clean up environmental problems. And I think that this seems like a really far away goal at this point, but I think that we can draw an analogy to other complex systems that can give us hope that it might be attainable. And so, Last year, during the pandemic, uh, another professor in the department, Marcus Covert, gave me a book. And the book was about weather prediction, the history of weather prediction in the world. And it talked about this guy, Louis Fry Richardson. And he had kind of this beautiful dream of being able to predict the weather 24 hours in the future. And he realized he could break up the problem into small parts. And he came up with this vision of a giant concert hall where there would be a conductor here and the conductor would be assigning computations for different parts of the world to different computers, by which I mean humans, that were all there in this huge concert hall. And he thought that it would take 300,000 people computing simultaneously to keep pace with the weather, right? And so he said in 1922, Maybe someday in the dim future, it will be possible to advance the computations faster than the weather advances and at a cost less than the saving to mankind, but this is a dream. So that was exactly 100 years ago, right? Where everyone said, okay, this is an impossible thing to do. Uh, and in 1945, we had the development of mainframe computers that dramatically sped up our ability to do computations. Um, and by the time we hit 2015, the 72 hour forecast was accurate you know, most of the time, right? So this is far beyond what even Lewis Fry Richardson could have dreamed. And so when we think about what drove this incredible progress, I think it was really three things. Um, it was advances in computational power, which we now have, like all of us have computers in our pockets that are more powerful than that mainframe computer from 1945. It was advances in the climate models and the theoretical, the math. But I think maybe most important was we established weather monitoring systems all over the globe. And all of those weather monitoring systems were making measurements across space and time, but they all used a really common language, which was the language of physical constants. So they didn't say it's 10% hotter or it's twice as wet as it was last year. They measured things in units of temperature, wind speed, you know, the amount of rain that fell. And so when we come back to this like long dream of being able to predict function from sequence, I think we're in a similar time where there have been a lot of really remarkable advances. So, you know, here, when we try and think about protein folding, there have been tremendous computational advances in using alpha fold to be able to predict protein structures. And I think, um, on the other end, the generation of high throughput cellular data provides huge amounts of data. And what I think we really need and, and what we're trying to focus on is generating lots of measurements of how proteins behave 
when you mutate them and when you don't under different conditions using the language of physical constants, using chemical, kinetic, and thermodynamic constants. Um, so that's kind of what my lab does is we try to develop new tools that will allow us to do this. Um, and we have three platforms that we've developed, two of which I'll talk about today. So the first is we have uh, valved reaction chambers that we can align to printed microarrays so that we can recombinantly express and purify 1500 proteins in parallel. Um, we have a platform I won't talk about today where we can spectrally encode uh, perlas, I just learned the word, uh, so that we can do multiplex reactions in parallel in a single small volume. And then a third platform we've developed is for single cell encapsulation within fact sortable droplets. So just to start, I'm gonna tell a first story that uses this first platform. And I wanna emphasize that this is a really collaborative project that's been led by, it was led by a talented team of a postdoc and graduate student that are both fully joint between my lab and Dan Hirschlag's lab. And uh, this really joint work I think was critical for, for being able to develop and apply this technology. So, okay. So just to motivate why we care about enzymes, it's really important um, for biology, enzymes underpin all of cellular metabolism, and they're the workhorse tools we use for every modern molecular biology reaction that we do. In medicine, they're the targets and processors of drugs, uh, and, and we want to know how mutations affect their function for precision medicine. And in engineering, as I mentioned, uh, the ability to design novel catal catalysts could be really transformative. And there's a, a lecture that Dan pointed me to from Linus Pauling in 1955 called The Future of Enzyme Research. And in this lecture, he said, when our understanding of enzyme activity becomes great enough, it will be possible to synthesize a catalyst. So the idea is if we understood how sequence and codes function, we should be able to create catalysts to do what we want. So it's reasonable to ask, how well are we doing so far? with our goal of designing enzymes? And the answer is we're really not doing that well yet. So if you look here, I'm showing you on the x-axis, this is the um, log transformed rate enhancement over the uncatalyzed reaction for natural enzymes. And you can see that natural enzymes can speed reactions by up to 30 orders of magnitude. They're really proficient, amazingly proficient catalysts. Our best efforts, at computational design, get maybe five, maybe 10 orders of magnitude. And that's true even if we take those designed enzymes and then we try to optimize them by multiple rounds of directed evolution, we still don't do as well as nature can do. That's the blue histogram. Um, and, and when we try and think about why, it's because the function of an enzyme, an en enzyme active site doesn't work on its own. So this is just an enzyme active site with a bound product. And when we can zoom out, we can see that those active site residues in the crystal structure are connected to other residues that are helping position them. And those residues are connected to other residues. So we've got kind of this giant protein complex and we have no idea what, what reactions are important for catalysis. And so if we try and think about how can we understand what all of those enzymes are doing, those residues are doing in an enzyme, we can kind of picture enzyme function as a three-dimensional space, where along one axis, we have every possible amino acid position. And another axis we, axis, we have every possible amino acid that could exist at that position. And in a third axis, we have some kind of phenotype that describes how that enzyme behaves under a particular set of conditions. So historically, when we've studied enzymes, we've done site-directed mutagenesis where we've taken a few residues, maybe the active site, we've mutated them. And then for each of those mutants, we've asked with the language of physical constants, how that mutation altered activity. So maybe we measured the initial reaction rate as a function of the substrate concentration, and then we could fit that to a michaelis menten curve and we could extract KCAT over KM or in KCAT and KM sometimes. Or maybe we've taken an inhibitor that looks like the ground state or looks like the transition state. Uh, and we've measured the reaction rate as a function of that inhibitor concentration. And we fit that curve to a competitive binding model. 
More recently, I think deep scanning mutagenesis approaches have been developed, and those are able to look at a much larger set of mutants. So most of these deep scanning mutagenesis assays look at every single possible position, what happens if you substitute every possible amino acid at that location. So you have a lot of different mutants, but for each mutant, you have a pretty low amount of information. So maybe you get the organismal fitness under a given set of conditions, or maybe you get the amount of product that was produced under, at a given time, but you don't know if, if an enzyme is tenfold down, it could be that it's 100% active, but only 10% folded, or it could be that it's 10% active and 100% folded, and you really can't discriminate any of those things from these measurements. And even worse, you can't predict from these measurements what kind of activity you're gonna see under another set of conditions. So this is two enzymes that have very different KCAD and KM values. If you assays them at five micromolar substrate concentration, you can see that they both have exactly the same rate of product formation. But if we just change, oops, sorry. If we just change the substrate concentration at which we're performing the experiment, now they behave really differently. And that's something you can only predict if you know those constants. So we've been proposing another, an alternative technology where now, let's say at every single position, we substitute two different amino acids that are very different. So we could put in a glycine where we'll remove the, the side chain and we'll increase the backbone flexibility. And we could also put in a valine, which should give us a hydrophobic amino acid that's kind of of average size. But now for each of these mutants, can we go back and we, can we measure the activity of the mutant under a bunch of different substrate concentrations and try and uh, again, derive these kinetic and thermodynamic constants. So the number of mutants that we're making is not as large as in a deep mutational scan, but the amount of measurements that we're making is very large. Uh, and so we're calling this approach HTMAC for high throughput microfluidic enzyme kinetics. And uh, the, the entire approach really relies on these valved microfluidic devices that have 1500 nanoliter scale reaction chambers with the fluid flow controlled by 4,500 different integrated on-chip valves. And the way that the assay works is we take a, we have a robotic printer where we print plasmids that encode the different enzymes that we'd like to assay. So I'm showing you here three spots, but normally we have 1500 spots on a glass slide. And then by hand, we align microfluidic devices so that each reaction chamber sits on top of a single plasmid spot. So each reaction chamber is programmed with a different known mutant. We can push in vitro transcription translation in mixture into like cell-free expression mixture into all of the chambers and just sit the device on a hot plate. So we can incubate and we can produce protein in every chamber. And I'm coloring the chambers green to show that I'm making an EGFP tagged protein. We can pattern the surfaces underneath these valves here with biotinylated BSA, neutravidin, anti-GFP, so that then we can capture the GFP tagged proteins in each chamber on the surface. And now we can iteratively introduce a fluorogenic substrate. So we can close a valve uh, so to kind of protect the surface bound enzymes, introduce a fluorogenic substrate, open the valve to start all of the reactions, and then just image the device over time so that we can see the amount of light that's produced uh, over time by each of these constructs. Um, and so just to give you a sense of why we think this is kind of a transformative technology, if we were to try and um, go through traditional biochemistry and transform and plate uh, our, our bacteria, grow up culture, um, purify the enzyme, exchange buffer, and do a, a separate well of an assay for every reaction, we could maybe do five enzymes in a week. And now with this platform, we're able to assay about 500 enzymes in triplicate in 48 hours. Um, and so I think the dirty secret that no one ever says when they talk about microfluidics is everyone just shows you the device. Um, the device isn't the whole part of it. So the device here is kind of sitting on top of this automated fluorescence microscope. And then we've built a bunch of um, sort of just all this is is uh, regulators to control the pressure of air that comes through. 
Uh, and then that air is directed through solenoid valves that are controlled by a computer to either pressurize or not pressurize the lines. And that's what opens and closes uh, the valves on the device. Um, and so I guess I wanna pause here before I move forward and see if there are any questions about like the platform or, or anything that people would want to know before I show you the data, just to, to make sure it's clear. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. There is one question. Yeah, in the determination of which amino acid you wanna uh, select yeah. uh, in created new mutants, how you can uh, see if certain uh, amino acid gonna be redundant? I mean, maybe you have two type amino acid, but uh, and they are chemically different, but in the product or the enzyme, they are the same. How you can differentiate that redundancies? Yeah, so I think, uh, I think it's a like, what we would love is we would love to be able to do every amino acid at every position, but we don't have the space. And so for us, we feel like if you make a substitution to an amino acid that's very similar to the native residue, it's basically like a very small perturbation. If you, you, know, if you take something that's charged and you make it hydrophobic, that's a big perturbation. So we're trying to kind of hedge our bets by choosing two that are different. I think if we move forward with a smaller enzyme, we'd like to choose more. So maybe you would have like something like glycine and alanine where you've removed the side chains, valine where you've made it hydrophobic, you know, perhaps lysine or arginine to put a positive charge and then aspartic acid to put a negative charge. You know, we'd like to try and think about how we could create a reduced alphabet that is perturbing the physical forces in the most efficient way. Uh, but for this, it was 526 amino acids, so we just had space to do two. Yeah. Okay, so uh, a first question would be, does it work at all? Uh, can we express and purify many enzyme mutants in parallel on the device? And so to ask this question, we started with an enzyme system that's been studied really extensively in the Hirschlag lab for decades, which is the al alkaline phosphatase superfamily. And we chose a model member that is a monomer that's not thought to go undergo any structural transitions during the cycle. It's a really proficient enzyme. It has a 10 to the 27th fold rate enhancement. It's got solved crystal structures, known fluorogenic substrates, um, and it's extremely stable. So we started by just taking the wild type cafe and then uh, five active site mutants and a catalytically dead mutant. And we printed them each 50 times around the device. Uh, and the first thing that we just asked was, could we make protein when we thought we were gonna make protein and not make protein when we shouldn't? And so this is a picture of kind of what the data looked like. So we'll get a large stitched image of a bunch of spots. And if you zoom in, you can see for each spot, we, we know that the plasmid that we printed there. Uh, and then we can find a circle so we can either quantify the intensity of the amount of, of enzyme that we made. We can calibrate this so we actually get a concentration in each chamber. And you can see in the areas where we have a plasmid label, we have a bright spot, we produce protein there. And in the areas where there's no plasmid label, it's dark. We don't see mixing between the chambers. So the next question is if we can make protein, do the proteins behave the way we expect they should when they're in the device? And so, uh, this is just a movie of what a portion of the device looks like while we do the experiments. Um, so we can just image over time and you can see the rate at which the intensity builds up is different for different chambers on the device. So to interpret this, we've written a suite of software tools where for every chamber, we have a picture of what the enzyme looked like after we made it. We can monitor over time and make sure that we don't lose a lot of the enzyme. And we also, every five assays or so, we go back and we measure the same thing. So we make sure that we're still getting the same results every five assays. Uh, we can create a standard curve in every single chamber that relates the amount of light produced to the amount of product that should be there. And then we can introduce a substrate at a single concentration and we can fit uh, this initial rate, 
we can wash that substrate out and we can repeat over multiple concentrations. In each case, we can fit the initial rate and then we can take these initial rates and plot them as a function of the substrate um, and get a michaelis menten curve and extract a KCAT and a KM. And what I think is exciting about the technology is this is the amount of data that we get from one chamber when we do these experiments. And over the course of a single experiment, you know, we have 1,568 of these reports, so we can do 10,000 reactions. And at the time that we published the paper, uh, we had run 200 devices and measured almost 700,000 different chemical reactions. Okay, so the next thing is, you know, when we do it like this, do we actually get the same answer that you get via traditional techniques? And so we had started with that test set of five active site mutations. Um, and here I'm showing you, this is the wild type pathway and the five active site mutations, the catalytically dead mutant and the skipped mutant. And these are KCAT, KM, and KCAT over KM. Uh, these are the values that we get for all of the chambers on the chip. And then I'm overlaying here um, with a dark circle what we would see off chip. So it seems like we get reliable information over about four orders of magnitude. So now we're sort of poised. We have the technology in hand you know, what can we do with it? What can we learn about how enzymes function? So the first question was just, what happens if you mutate every single residue in an enzyme and ask whether it affects catalysis? Um, and so here's what the data look like. So um, here on the x-axis I'm showing you, this is, it's hard to see right here, it's the log two transformed KCAT over KM for a valine mutant normalized to the wild type mutant. And then on the Y plot, you know, this is like a volcano plot, like we see all the time in genomics. This is just the probability with which this is statistically significantly different than the wild type value. And so you can see there's a really limited number of things that appear to speed the enzyme up. And these are, some of these are most likely false positives, but there are a lot of things that really um, destroy the enzyme activity. And when we project these uh, results onto the enzyme crystal structure, Here's what the enzyme crystal structure looks like, and this is the active site. Um, we see kind of what you would expect. So the dark blue is the more severe effects, and they cluster near the catalytic, near the active site. Um, but we see effects that extend all the way to the enzyme surface. This is what we see for valine. We see pretty much the same thing when we look at the glycine means. And overall, what we see is that a really large number of mutations 700 out of 1,000, um, and the vast majority of positions have a statistically significant effect on catalysis when they're mutated, which leads to the question of, you know, why are we seeing this? And a first explanation could just be maybe when we make a mutation, we're just unfolding the enzyme. And so that's not that interesting. It doesn't have anything to do with catalysis. Um, let's look for that. So I think here it's kind of important to go back to our michaelis menten uh, plot. And remember that it's really not just enzyme plus, plus substrate, it's folded enzyme plus substrate. And that enzyme exists in an equilibrium between folded and unfolded po populations. So to test for this, um, Sean Costello and Susan Marcus's lab did some circular dichroism experiments as a function of urea that showed that the wild type enzyme was really, really stable. That's what this looks like. If we shifted this curve over, such that we begin to see effects from changes in stability, that would mean that by the time we got to two molar urea, everything should be totally unfolded. And so we decided, okay, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna repeat the experiment, but we'll do it in the presence of two molar urea. And when we do that, we see no effect, right? So it doesn't matter whether we expose the enzyme to two molar urea, it looks the same, which suggests it's not unfolding. That's not why we're seeing effects. So the next question was, well, maybe it's not just that they're unfolded, maybe they're misfolded because it's such a stable enzyme. And so here we have to remember, not only does the enzyme exist in an in a equilibrium between folded and unfolded populations, but somehow it has to get to the folded state. And with a really stable enzyme, you might run the risk that it's trapped in a long-lived catalytically inactive misfolded intermediate conformation. And so one way that we could test and see if that's true is we could change the temperature and the amount of zinc. I didn't tell you this, but it's an enzyme that has four zincs, two in the active site and two elsewhere to fold. 
So if we vary the amount of zinc and we vary the amount of temperature during folding, but not during the assay, we should be able to probe for this. So that's what we did. We took our library and we expressed at different conditions. Um, then we added cyclohexamide to stop translation. We allowed everything to mature. Then we cooled it down to the same temperature for all of the assays. And we looked to see what sort of effects we saw. And now, unlike the situation where we were looking for unfolding, we do see a lot of effects. So there are many, many mutations where at a low temperature, they actually don't really reduce the activity that much from wild type, but at a high temperature, they actually have a very strong effect. And that's the same with zinc. So, and, and here's, you know, we can look on the enzyme structure and see where many of these amino acids are that are changing the folding pathway. And we can also ensure that this is something that doesn't just happen in the device, but it happens outside of the chip in real life by running native gels where we can look and hear for everything at 23 degrees Celsius, both a wild type and a lot of these, these mutants that we think are misfolding, they all run as a single band uh, on a native gel. And then when we heat the expression temperature, now we can see that all of these mutants that we think are misfolding on chip, we also see the appearance of a second band that's a misfolded band, not the native band. The last thing we can do to convince ourselves that this is misfolding is we can add Thermolysin, which is a protease that cleaves exposed hydrophobic residues that shouldn't be exposed. We see the disappearance of this band. So it, it is misfolded. And if we compare the activity before and after we add the thermolysin, it's the same. And so all of those things together tell us that there's a long lived catalytically inactive misfolded state that's induced by some of those mutations. And I'm not going to talk about this, how we do it here, but we're also able to take information from some other substrates and figure out how much of the loss in activity is from misfolding and how much of the loss of activity is actually a true catalytic effect. And now we can go back and we can say, okay, what if we look at effects on catalysis alone? We still see that the effects on catalysis are not restricted just to the enzyme active site, but they actually extend all the way to the surface. So all of these residues are actually really important for catalysis. Um, so that kind of leads to the question of, you know, why do any of these uh, mutations have catalytic effects? And so we can take some of the knowledge of how the enzyme does its chemistry to really like dr drill down into that. So here we know this is an enzyme that has these two active site residues, K162 and R164, that make hydrogen bonds to the phosphoryl oxygen of a monoester substrate. For a diester substrate, that oxygen is methylated. So those hydrogen bonds are already broken. So if we're making a mutation to R164 and K162, we expect it should have a really big effect on monoester catalysis, but it shouldn't really alter diester catalysis at all because they weren't doing anything there in the first place. And this is just kind of showing you uh, in the structure these two residues kind of lie at the end of something that we call the specificity helix. So when we do these measurements, uh, I'm showing you this is the, this is the diester uh, versus the monoester catalysis. Monoester is on the x-axis here. And you can see that these mutations on the device, they do what we think. They're down in monoester catalysis, but they're not down, and they're even slightly up in diester catalysis. And when we look at all of the other residues, we see that there are other residues that behave kind of the same. So most of them have an equal effect on both uh, monoester and diester catalysis. So they probably have nothing to do with positioning R164 and K162. But these ones that are behaving in kind of the same way, they do. And when we look at where they exist in the crystal structure, we can see that there are a whole bunch of residues that are hydrogen bonded to K162 and R164. And why I think this is kind of cool is let's say in the future, you wanted to design the specificity, uh, you wanted to alter the specificity of an enzyme. These might be pointing you to residues that you could mutate where you wouldn't necessarily dramatically reduce catalysis by messing up the active site. You could be tuning catalysis by changing the residues that are required for positioning those residues. Um, and so again, when we look at the residues that have these impacts, we can see that there are many near the active site. 
But when we look at the whole enzyme, some of them extend all the way to the surface. And so here's another thought is if we are trying to allosterically control enzyme function, perhaps now this is revealing uh, distal surface pockets that we should be targeting in order to distally control the specificity of the molecule. Um, and so just to talk about one other aspect of um, enzyme function that we can monitor, we can look here at uh, these enzymes employ a ground state destabilization mechanism. So uh, if you, the, the ground state itself is destabilized and you can make mutations that stabilize the ground state. And the way that we read that out is those mutations that, that stabilize the ground state increase the affinity for a ground state analog, which is inorganic phosphate. And so we can measure catalysis as a function of inorganic phosphate concentration. We see some residues weaken phosphate inhibition, others tighten the binding for inorganic phosphate. And I think what's interesting about this is now if we look at, um, these are all of the residues throughout the enzyme that have this impact on ground state destabilization. We can compare that with what we saw for determining specificity. And it's like we're beginning to pick out that different residues have different jobs in catalysis. Some are involved in specificity, some are involved in ground state destabilization. And now we kind of have a map of who is who and what they're doing. Um, and, and maybe interestingly, we can see on the y-axis, this is the effect on catalysis. On the x-axis, this is the effect on uh, inorganic phosphate inhibition. And there are mutations you can make that alter inhibition without altering catalysis. The inhibitor is also the product. So now you could engineer in negative feedback loops for activity uh, with a single amino acid substitution. So it's sort of a, a rational design idea. Um, okay. So, you know, in general, we've been able to take this uh, crystal structure. We've been able to say for every single amino acid, how does it affect the observed k of KM? We've been able to break that into effects on folding and effects on catalysis. We've been able to say what different parts of the folding pathway are being affected. And then we can even drill down deeper with additional inhibitors and uh, substrates to to really get a detailed picture of enzyme function. And so now we're trying to use this platform in a bunch of different ways. We're developing a companion assay where we can quantify stability and misfolding, even in the absence of a catalytic readout. Um, we're trying to create ground truth data sets of sequence function relationships that we could use to calibrate uh, a, a machine learning attempts to predict not just fold, but function and stability from sequence. Um, we're trying. We're trying to. Uh, sorry. We're trying to see whether we can use this idea to scan distal interfaces to identify allosteric handles that we could use to control function. Um, we're trying to take human variants of uncertain significance and classify them by their functional effects, um, and then. A, a former postdoc from my lab who's now starting her independent position is trying to make the exact same sets of measurements uh, in these devices as in cells and sort of compare when is the molecular fitness landscape the same as the organismal fitness landscape and when do the two differ? Um, so I guess I'll, maybe I'll, I don't know whether I should pause for questions here or talk about the other platform first. Yeah. There are two questions okay. from the first part. Yeah, so let's device. do that. Maybe. So one is from Agustin Lopez. Do you have to immobilize each variant? Yes. So every variant is immobilized, but they're all made in parallel and immobilized in mm -hmm. parallel. The tricky part is that, um, you know, the tricky part is generating the library. So unlike a pooled screen where you can just transform cells, we have to make variant libraries where each one is in a different well of a multi-well plate. So for this, we just did it by hand. We did the royal we, Craig and Daniel, did 1100 quick change mutagenesis uh, reactions to make that library. We recently published a way to do it like without so much manual labor, but that's the challenging first hurdle. Yeah. And the second question is from Joseph Dubrovsky, which is a technical question. What is the diameter of the fluidic device? Yeah, so the device itself sits on a one inch by three inch slide, like a standard 
epoxy silane coated slide. So you can just sit it on a microscope with no modification. Uh, and that each chamber has about one nanoliter of liquid and the chamber diameters are about 150 microns in diameter and the chambers are about 15 microns tall. Okay. Another question from Erika Garay. The platform allows to you to perform post-translational modifications in the enzymes. So I would love to do this. <laughs> uh, and I think there's no reason that we can't, right? There's a lot of really beautiful orthogonal translation systems that have been um, you know, developed by a variety of labs, including Jim Schwartz and Michael Jewett. Um, and so I would love to start using some of those orthogonal cell-free translation systems to put post-translational modifications in specified positions like phospho residues. And I think an advantage is, you know, in many cases, your incorporation isn't 100%, but that's okay. Because in this case, if you don't incorporate the orthogonal tRNA, you're gonna have a stop and you won't get pulled down. So you'd end up mobilizing only things that were full length and actually had your substituted, t your substituted amino acid at the correct position. I'd love to do that. Uh, but I don't have anyone working on it now. Another two questions. Okay. From, from Arnold Ronsalet. Do you plan to explore the adaptation of ex extrophil or high low temperature pH extremes to compare orthologs? So, uh, so Mason, I guess Margot Penny, who is the, like, she was a graduate student in the Hirschlag lab. She did a brief postdoc in my lab, and now she's an independent fellow at UCSF. She had published a really interesting paper looking at temperature adaptation in enzymes. And basically, uh, she analyzed like the entire corpus of metagenomic data, which linked many enzymes to the optimal growth temperature for the organism that they're from. Um, and she found a lot of really interesting properties that appeared to correlate with thermal stability. Uh, and for what Mason has been doing, he's chosen 48 PAFE orthologs, and we've been trying to repeat a lot of these same chemical, these same characterizations to see for all of the monoesterases, how much do they differ? Uh, and within that set, we have some thermophiles and psychrophiles so that we could begin to see, are there different strategies for optimizing activity versus stability for organisms that come from different temperatures, but that work is still ongoing but I think is really interesting, yeah. There's another question from Gloria Saf. Very, result, uh, very interesting results. Epistasis is, epistasis is an important factor affecting, and affecting activity unfolding. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to catch that up from single site mutation? Yeah, so we, uh, like a weakness is we've started with a single site scan. Um, and I think a strategy that we'd like to employ in the future is now when you have, I think there are a lot of questions that the single site scan has brought up that could be answered with higher order mutant cycles. So we might expect, uh, we've divided the protein into, you know, we're calling them these regions of residues that are contiguous in 3D space and appear to have the same effect on catalysis. Rama Ranganathan has pre previously done, and Kim Reynolds and, and a host of other people, uh, Debbie Marks, have done a lot of phylogeny-based uh, comparisons where they've identified sectors, groups of residues that appear to co-evolve. It remains an open question if sectors and regions are the same. We couldn't do statistical coupling analysis in this system for technical reasons. Um, so, are they the same? One way that you could begin to ask what is a more accurate representation or prediction of connectivity is higher order mutant cycles where you mutate two residues within a sector or a region and across, and you try and ask whether they're synergistic in some way or purely additive. That could tell you about connections, um, but we haven't done any of it. And it requires choosing your mutant libraries wisely, right? You have to be really thoughtful about which mutants you're gonna to choose to mutate alone and in combination. And so, you know, as a first step, we did the single scan, but I totally agree with Gloria that additional higher order mutant cycles are important. Okay, so another question. Actually, actually, from the Sorry. Another question, which are two from Enrique Moret. Why do you 
use plasmid instead of only DNA sequence of the protein? That's the first question. So we can use either. We can use plasmids or linear DNA sequence. Um, I guess what's nice is with plasmids, you know, we have, kind of have this long-term glycerol stock that we can just ask the bacteria to make more of any time. So that's kind of cheap. Uh, and when we're starting to do thousands of PCR reactions with expensive polymerase, it adds up. Um, but there's, we have done it with linear expression templates and you can do that too. Okay, and the other question is the structure of the mutants is based on models or they were really, were crystallized? Yeah, so all, uh, like all of this is just taking the wild type crystal structure and then showing the magnitude of the effect at the position within the wild type, uh, within the wild type protein. So we have no crystal structures um, for any of these. Uh, we have, we've, we've recently crystallized, I guess we've crystallized the, the wild type protein in the presence of additional analogs, but we haven't crystallized any mutants. Okay. Okay, so maybe I'll, um, I'll talk a little bit and then you can tell me when it ends so I don't go over. Okay, so I don't, I don't wanna use up everybody's time. We can just stop at one point because it's, okay. Uh, so the last, the last thing that I wanna talk about is I think that first platform it can generate a lot of really interesting data and we're very interested in hosting people to come and try and use the platform with us, but it's hard to build in your own lab. And so there's another technology that we've been developing that we're excited about because I think it's really translatable to other labs more easily. Um, and that's this technology for using double emulsions, which is a water, oil, water droplet um, that can be, can be sorted using commercial fax machines. So I think a good first question is like, who cares about this anyway? Why would you even want to sort a droplet with a cell inside? Um, and I think there are a few good reasons. Um, one is that, you know, we're familiar with the tremendous power of fax, which is, you know, a really early and mature single cell technology, which can sort cells based on the expression of cell surface markers or reported reporter genes. Um, but there are a lot of things that we can't use fax machines to sort on. We typically can't sort on the on secreted proteins. We can't sort on the nucleic acid content of a cell. Um, and we can't sort on phenotypes that depend on interactions between two cells where we wanna keep them together uh, so we can figure out who interacted with who later. I think a more pedestrian reason, but still really important, I think for most labs around the world, including mine, is um, it's really expensive to do single cell genomics and you end up sequencing, a lot of times if you're using DropSeq or things like that, you sequence a lot of droplets that don't have a cell in them. And that takes a lot of reagents. So if you had the ability to just get rid of any droplet that doesn't have a cell in it, it would just mean that, um, that you could save on sequencing costs. So this was our goal, was to develop scalable and translatable technologies for sorting cell-containing droplets. Um, <clears throat> and right now, there are a lot of technologies that are commercially available and very prevalent for taking cells and putting them inside a water in oil emulsion. So it's a water droplet suspended in kind of an oil flow. Um, and then, you know, the, the dream would be to take these droplets and put them in wells of a multi-well plate so you could interrogate that cell later. And making these water and oil droplets is super easy. Like there are lots of commercial devices to do it. Uh, pretty much any microfluidic device that you do to make this will work the first time. But the sorting then becomes really hard. So if you want to sort a water and oil droplet, you typically have to build your own on-chip sorter that uses like a fluorescence detector and a field programmable gator, gator ray and on-chip electrodes in order to sort cells into keeper waste. They're pretty slow and you can only look at one color. And so we've been trying to take a slightly different approach where now instead of making just a water and oil droplet, we're making these double emulsion water and oil and water droplets, which are a little more kind of boutique. But the advantage is this water and oil and water droplet just kind of looks like a really big cell. So now we can plug into 50 years of fax instrumentation and we can just use a commercial fax machine that is available at most companies and institutions so that we can try and sort these droplets. And you know, an advantage here is that these sorters can sort on many different colors. They can sort really fast. Um, 
and they're already built to accept 96 and 30, 384 well plates. So this is a project that was really initially pioneered by Cara Brower, who's a graduate student in my lab that recently moved on. And she just started with the question, can we make and sort stable double emulsions? And so here's what the setup looks like. So we just have four syringe pumps. We have um, a pretty cheap high-speed high camera and then a microfluidic device. And this is like a cheap light microscope that you can buy off of Amazon. Um, and to see whether or not we could actually use the fax machine to sort the droplets, Cara made a set of droplets where about 20% of them had fluorescently labeled BSA inside, and the 80% were empty. Then she put them into this Sony SH800 fax machine. Um, and when we look at the forward and side scatter, we can see that there's a really clear population. That's our droplets. If we get on these droplets and we look as a function of the fluorescent signal, we can see about 18% are positive. That's in line with what we thought. And if we sort them and we look at what came out, we can see that the droplets are still intact and we correctly isolated all of the fluorescent droplets that we wanted. Um, so the next thing is if we really wanna do single cell biology, we have to not only be able to sort droplets, but we have to be able to sort a droplet that we want. And so <clears throat> Kara came up with a plan to sort droplets into a plate. She was gonna put 100 droplets, 10, one droplets or no droplets into a plate. And then she did this and she just took a light microscope and she imaged and she counted how many droplets were in each of these wells. Um, and at the end of the day, you can see, this is where we wanted to have one droplet. This outer droplet is actually the fax droplet, like, the, like fax makes a droplet. So this is kind of a triple emulsion where it's a fax droplet with a double emulsion inside. Um, but about 70% of the time, when we wanted to sort a single droplet, we got a single droplet and we never got two droplets. 30% of the time we didn't get a droplet. And that's pretty consistent with what people see when they try and sort single cells too. <clears throat> so the next question was, people have done this before with mammalian cells and, and uh, sorry, with bacterial cells and yeast because they're really small. Could we do it with mammalian cells? And so Cara teamed up with Margarita from Bo Wang's lab. And the goal was, could we take a, a set of large complex cells, put them into our double emulsion device and make these single cell PICO reactors and then sort them via fax. And the, the problem, which is like not conceptually that hard, is just that if the droplet is too small, the, the uh, cell can't fit inside it. Uh, if the droplet's too big, the droplet won't go through the fax nozzle. So we're really looking for a size of droplet that's just right, where we get one cell in there and we, we encapsulate at the rate that we expect. Um, and so here's just a movie of, of what this looks like. So here, this is an, an aqueous stream. You can see there's little cells that are coming in here. This is the first nozzle where we wrap the cell in a water and oil droplet, goes through this resistive element, and then it hits a second nozzle where we wrap it again uh, in an aqueous shell. So we've got this, this thin double emulsion droplet. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. We can image and we can see calcine stained mouse embryonic stem cells that are encapsulated within our double emulsion droplets. Um, and we can even ask like, are they being encapsulated at the rate at which we think they should be encapsulated? So we expect that this encapsulation should be a random process that's described by a Poisson process where we have a characteristic lambda that says, you know, sort of the occupancy. We should be able to predict this lambda based on the concentration of cells that we load, uh, the droplet volume, and then how much of the volumetric flow is coming from the cell suspension. Uh, and when we count, the probability density of the number of cells per droplet, we see that it's pretty well fit by this uh, stochastic process. So we're, we're getting the number of, of full droplets that we expect, we see about 2% occupancies. <clears throat> and I think what's maybe interesting is if you look as a function of the concentration of the cells and the droplet volume, most single cell RNA-seq assays operate out here in like the nanoliter volume regimes. Uh, and that means that they're really susceptible to having multiple cells in a single droplet. 
for where we are, we're down in kind of this peak leader, tons of peak leader volume. We have very little chance of getting more than one droplet. And I think just from a cost savings, we use a hundredfold less stuff when we do the assays. So you can save money immediately. You can save about a hundredfold of your reagent costs, which becomes pretty significant when you're working with some of these very expensive enzymes. We can take these droplets, we can put them into a fax machine, and again, we can detect the calcium stained cell positive droplets from the empty droplets. <clears throat> and we can do it for a whole bunch of different cells. So this is the calcium signal on the x-axis um, against one of the scatter signals. And you know, for a variety of different mammalian cell types, we can get them into the droplets and we can visualize that they're there. And I think um, we've been working, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but I'd be happy to talk about it another time. We've been working on trying to begin preparing sequencing libraries from single cells in these droplets, but it's not quite ready for prime time. What we have been thinking about is how can we make this technology more translatable and adoptable by other labs? Um, and so this is work that um, Cara really launched with Suzanne Calhoun, who was a rotation student, who went on to join Jerry Fuller's lab. Um, and so, Double emulsion droplets have this reputation of being really finicky and a lot harder to produce than a single emulsion droplet. So all Cara and Suzanne did um, is they just took <clears throat> this inner core media, the oil and the outer aqueous flow, and <clears throat> they put it into these double emulsion devices and they just systematically varied the flow rates and they varied the identity of the inner aqueous buffer and they varied the surfactant that they added. And then they just characterized the droplets that they got via microscopy, sometimes via fax. And they also measured via rheology, the interfacial surface tension of different oil water, like buffer oil combinations. And so the data that they got just looks something like this, where I'm showing you, um, these are a series of different flow rate combinations for the same buffer. And as you vary the flow rate systematically, you can change the degree to which the core or the shell, you know, the relative sizes of the inner aqueous pore and the shell. And you want kind of a thin shell for facts and, you, and often you wanna have like a larger aqueous pore if you're gonna grow cells so they don't eat up all their food too fast. And we repeated this experiment where we looked at different flow rates and how they affected the, the inner aqueous core and the shell volume in two different labs with two different devices and we always got the same thing. And so we were wondering if this is true, if they really always act the same way, why is it that double emulsions have this reputation of being really finicky? And we started getting our answer when we tried using these double emulsions for a variety of different molecular biology assays and cell biology assays. So, you know, three things that you might wanna do in these cells and that we're interested in is you could do very ultra high throughput screening for enzymatic function. So you won't get the same level of resolution we got with the HTMAC device, but you could screen very large libraries for their activity with a fluorescent substrate. Uh, a lot of people are interested in growing microbes in, inside these double emulsion reactors. And we have a collaborator who's interested in doing that. Or maybe you wanna grow uh, mammalian cells. And to us, I think we all think, okay, it's an aqueous buffer, doesn't really matter. But each of these different buffer combinations have very different salts, very different protein content, and very different surfactants, right? So we generally think like tween is the same as, uh, you know, non-ionic, but whatever, they're all kind of the same. They're just a detergent that we use for cell lysis. And what we discovered was we could have exactly the same flow rate. And when we started uh, taking droplets that looked like this with PBS, uh, when we changed it to NP40, we saw a very dramatic difference in the droplet geometry. Uh, and we could even see if you add just a small amount of detergent, you would go from having these nice single core droplets to having droplets that have multi cores and all kinds of funny behaviors. So <clears throat> Suzanne comes from a chemical engineering background. And she went in the Fuller lab and she used this pendant drop rheology assay where she just created hanging drops of different aqueous buffers surrounded by different oils. And then she just tried to estimate the interfacial surface tension from imaging these droplets. So she made these measurements 
And what she discovered was if you take those interfacial surface tension measurements and you take all of the flow rates and you calculate a capillary number, now we can kind of look at um, the behavior of, of you know, these droplets over a whole bunch of different regimes. And what I'm showing you here is, is these filled circles are, are regions where we get a single core droplet. Uh, that's what we want. And then we see different instabilities, which will be, you know, things are out of phase. Some things have a core and some things don't. Sometimes there's multiple cores. Sometimes there's no cores. When she collapsed it in this way, she could see all of this kind of random seeming behavior was really reproducible when you thought about the physics of how these droplets were generated. And she was able to identify a central standard region of flow rates that should work for everybody across a variety of different materials when they're trying to make these droplets. Um, so you know, I hope that I've convinced you that we can make these double emulsion droplets. It doesn't take that much um, that much equipment, and we'd be really happy to share suggestions for how to implement in other labs. Uh, we've kind of opened up for the first time the ability to put mammalian cells in these droplets to do novel single cell assays. Um, I didn't show you this, but we can uh, start doing some molecular biology from single cells in these droplets as a step towards library generation. Um, and, you know, once we can think about these from a physical perspective, we can kind of just demystify uh, some of, of why they've had this reputation of being really finicky. Um, so in closing, I just really want to thank um, everybody in my lab for uh, all of their work towards the projects I've told you about today, as well as other projects uh, and my funding sources and all of you for your attention and questions and hospitality. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Polly. Very nice, very interesting. Um, now the, the seminar is open for questions. You can raise your hand either in the, in the in the Zoom or put your question in the chat. I don't see more questions. Okay, <clears throat> is How it possible want? to double encapsulate <clears throat> samples fixated with paraffin or like from paraformaldehyde? So can you repeat? Omar? Yeah, sorry. Is it possible to double encapsulate samples that are fixated with paraffin? I mean, we can double create it with paraffin. Yeah, well, I'm thinking to um, uh, use your your technologies with a cancer samples, mm -hmm. and most ah, of like them are fixed fixated. samples. Yeah, fixed examples. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I guess would be would be my answer. I mean, we could try and do that, um, but I guess once it's fixed, it's kind of all together anyway. So do you need do you need to put it around? Do you need to put a second droplet around it? I guess would be my question. Or is it already good because it's all kind of linked? You know, I think the droplets are really good if something's going to diffuse away and you need to capture it and keep it with its its cell of origin, which maybe if you've already fixed, you might have the ability to do. I don't know. I mean, it, it might enhance the efficiency. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. have a question so it's very simple can you do the same thing with these droplets but with isolated nuclei yes have you tried that uh we've done it with some plant nuclei actually because actually for other things not rna seq for mm -hmm. but for our techniques that only involves the nuclei but mm -hmm. it's in the nuclei mm -hmm. so it's more it's cleaner mm -hmm. to isolate the nuclei and then to probably to introduce in these droplets and then to do some single nuclei assays I mean, I think it, so. What we what we've spent a lot of time doing is we were trying to we've been trying to do reverse transcription from single cells in the droplets, which is hard because the cells have a bunch of endogenous. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were trying to sort based on the presence or absence of a particular transcript, and the cells have some endogenous DNAs that kind of chew up your probes. Mm -hmm. uh, an advantage of nuclei is they don't have that cell lysate mediated inhibition. Mm -hmm. And so it should work very well, but we haven't, we haven't quantified how well it works. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I have more than a question, a comment, and it's about the first, the first the slide mm -hmm. that you presented with the activity mm -hmm. of the enzymes, the, the ones that had been 
uh, engineer mm -hmm. compared with the natural ones, mm -hmm. right? In which the natural ones are much more active or better, mm -hmm. more robust, robust than the ones that have been engineering. Mm -hmm. And this is because uh, talking with someone, with Jim Calonaga, someday we were talking about this. And he mentioned that at the end, the enzyme or any factor, whatever, a protein, evolved inside the cell, it's selected inside the cell. And inside the cell, it's not, it's interacting with many different things yes. during the cell cycle, not always the same things. Yeah. And, and this, then this protein was selected, or this mm -hmm. enzyme was selected under that conditions to mm -hmm. be very robust to, to function well. And, and then there is, we have this doubt that, that someday this is going to be able to, to be uh, performed in vitro in order to have a simulation or something similar to what the conditions of the cells are in order to select mm -hmm. new activities or, or more robust enzymatic activities, whatever. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a really great question. Like we think about this a lot for transcription factors is another, I guess some of the question is what's the relationship between how something functions in vitro and how it functions in vivo? Right, and, and in a lot of cases, when we think about the evolutionary pressures, they're different than the selection pressures that we would think, right? So uh, for transcription factors, for example, we've shown from some experiments that you really don't want them to be super high affinity, right? You want them to be kind of moderate affinity so that they can come on and come off and they're not stuck there for forever. For enzymes, it's another great example. Like they only, the evolutionary pressure, first, the evolutionary pressure is only to be as good as you need to be under a given set of conditions. If the enzyme in the pathway that comes before you is rate limiting, it doesn't matter how fast you are because you're, you're never going to be selected for your fastness because your rate is really limited by the availability of your substrate. Similarly, you know, for us, you can imagine a lot of these misfolded things that we see in a cell, they're being they're being identified and chewed up and degraded really quickly, right? So in a cell, a, a protein is simultaneously having to evolve to fold properly with the help of chaperones. Uh, and then to perform, you know, there might be multiple constraints simultaneously on the ability to, maybe you can't be too good at this because then it would compromise your ability to do that. And so I do think, I think an assumption of deep scanning mutagenesis is often that the two selection pressures are the same and that deep scanning mutagenesis is reporting on molecular fitness. I don't think that's true. I think they're two different things. I think there's a molecular fitness landscape and there's a cellular fitness landscape. Those two things are different. And I think that they're both incredibly interesting and important to probe. We don't, you know, except for industrial applications, we rarely care about protein function outside of a cell. Um, and so I think both types of approaches provide complementary and important synergistic information for understanding how physical forces dictate cell state. Yeah. yeah. More questions? Well, uh, here's one question. So? Oh, there's another one there. Uh, hi, um, I have a question. When you use this technology uh, in complex tissues, did you assess or did you see a significant difference, uh, a significant difference between assigning the phenotype to the cells with just the gene, and the single cell gene information, and the single cell gene information and information of facts? Yeah. So, so I think that's a great question. I'll be totally transparent that we've been spending the last three or four years mostly just doing. Uh, I mean, I think it's interesting, but I think a lot of people think it's just really boring engineering, right? Like, how do we make stable droplets? How long do they last? Do cells grow in them? How do we make them more reproducible? So we really haven't started asking any biology questions yet. We haven't even made a sequencing library inside a droplet. We think we can do it, but we haven't done it. So I think it's interesting to ask if you put it in a droplet and fact sort it versus just fact sort it by itself, you know, are there different mechanical responses that you see after going through the facts process that are like, what's different if you don't have mechanical shear, but instead you have the stress of being encapsulated in some way? Uh, we have no idea 
about that at all. And I think, you know, another, I think a lot of people have been sort of asking, we define cell state right now in two different ways, really. We define it by the combination of cell surface markers that are displayed. And then we define it by an RNA-seq transcriptome. But are those, the, you know, I guess, how many, are those always telling us all of the different unique cell states? Or if you were to look at, um, if you were look, to look at transcriptomes that were partitioned by the presence or absence of particular splice variants or the secretory profiles of a cell, would you see different cell states? I think that's what this technology could start to allow you to answer, but we have not done any of it yet. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the data over your methodology from the enzymes, how you were gonna plan to make this data available for mm -hmm. other person? I mean, you have your problem and it's like in your lab, but how you can make that data mm -hmm. in persistent databases like in CBI or something mm -hmm. like that? How you plan in do, in do that? Yeah, so I think we have, we release like all of our device design files, all of our, Jupyter notebooks and all of the code, all of the data are freely available. We don't, right now we haven't given anybody the images just because it's huge. If somebody wanted them, they could have them, but we have all of the text files from every experiment is in an OSF repository. So anyone can download it. I think a more important question is, right? We can start depositing this information in the Brenda database so that systems biologists have access to it. But it's not the Brenda database, it really isn't set up right now for uploading like you know 5,000 constants. It's like one at a time. So we've talked to them about whether they want it. They were like, well, we don't know that people actually want kinetic constants from 1,100 mutants of the same enzyme. I think probably people do. But I, I think that you bring up a really great question about like the availability of data in a single place, right? The reason why we have AlphaFold is because of the PDB. And that was freely downloadable. We have all of these omics data sets that all come in the same format, right? Everybody has to upload like bed files and, and upload everything that comes in the same format in the same place. So systems biologists can look for it. What about now we're starting to have all of these different types of in vitro data where it's not standard? Like imaging isn't standard. No, but there's not a central repository of images because each microscope has a different proprietary format and it's hard to upload the images. Similar now, we're starting to have like, there's, you know, uh, <clears throat> different uh, stability data sets. There's a bunch of different data sets, but none of them are at the scale where they have a home. Uh, and I think that's something we should address as a global community. Like we put, we make all of ours available in an OSF repository with every single paper we publish, but that's not in a central location. And I would love for it to be. Thank you so much. Okay, it seems like that was the last question. Thank you very much, Polly. It was very nice. Thank and you. thank you for participating in the program. Thank you so much. Gracias. Muchas gracias por invitarme. Yeah. Rápido. Este, dentro de ocho días, el seminario va a ser en la mañana. Yo creo que va a ser a las diez de la mañana porque la, la speaker no va a venir. Y este, está en Suiza, pero como fue el cambio, bueno, tiene muchas que hacer, prefiere lo más temprano posible. Entonces va a ser a las 10 de la mañana el seminario la semana que entra. Entonces yo les los mantendré informados. Gracias.